Um, Uh, so good evening again. Uh, my name is Mark Fernandez, an old student from Tar Institute. So, is anyone, for anyone, is this their first time here? Monday nights, yeah. Great. Okay. Very good. So, um, so we'll start with the uh, the refuge and generating Brody Cheetah Press. So I'll just read it out once, and all you all you need to do is just think about the words and the meaning, and that's sufficient. So. Um, I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the highest assembly. From the virtuous merit that I collect by practicing giving and other perfections, may I attain the state of a Buddha to be able to benefit all sentient beings. So, so that's the prayer, as I mentioned before, that we do at the beginning of every teaching. We repeat it three times, so it's setting a very good motivation. Um, if you read the words more closely, so it's um, going for refuge, it's I'm taking safe direction. So when you think of safe direction, or you think of refuge, you think that you're undercover, you know, something, isn't it? So it's not exactly like that because that means you're sort of hiding. This is sort of saying, well, I've got problems, I've got issues, but there's somewhere, there's a direction I can go in that leads me away from that, leads me to happiness. So that's the safe direction. So you can see, well, it's not like a um, celestial being is going to, again, uh, tap the wand and solve your problems. It's not like that. It's you, the student, going, oh, I'm going to go in the, this direction because this direction leads to happiness and away from suffering. So there's a lot of uh, emphasis on the student in, in Buddhism. So. So that's something to to um, to keep in mind. So, and uh, who are you going to refuge to? It's to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the highest assembly. So, so we say we're going for refuge to the Buddha because the Buddha was the human being, the historical human being who achieved the state of enlightenment as a human being. So he had all problems. Life wasn't easy. And anyway, his life story is worth reading. But the, the, the thing with him was, well, he was born into a royal family, but even in that, with all the wealth and no deprivation, no, suffer, no overt suffering, he still saw that there was a suffering state, even in, even in that type of birth, where you know, effectively he was coddled. You know, he had everything he could desire, but it wasn't enough. So he went looking for the source of happiness. So he went away from the palace, and he, um, you know, he tried different things. You know, try yoga, try meditation, tried starvation, deprivation, ascetic practices, and he actually got a group of followers who thought, well, this guy's good because he's actually he's going the way we are. He's giving up everything, everything material, and he's going to he's going in this direction where it's deprivation, asceticism. So. So you think, oh, well, that, well, the Buddha must have got it because that's the way to happiness. But even the Buddha decided that that was too extreme, that that wasn't going to get him happiness. And what happened to his followers? They said, no thanks, you know, you, you, you're not who we thought you were. So they went, they left him. So, so he, actually, he actually found a middle way where he said, well, I don't have to deprive myself, I don't have to be too overtly material, but there's a middle way that I can that I can see that leads away from suffering and towards happiness, and that's what we credit the Buddha with that he's passed that down through the thousands of years to now that we still have that lineage of teachings that show us how to achieve happiness and how to how to avoid suffering. So <clears throat> um, the uh, the Dharma are the actual teachings. So. They're the physical, so we've got lots of, in the corners there, both corners, they're the, the actual Kangyu and Tangyu texts, so they're the, all the, and they represent the teachings of the Buddha, the different different sort of commentaries and teachings. So so the, the Dharma is the, oh you say it's the physical teachings or the texts, the, you know, the actual sutras and so on, but it's actually when you flip it back, it's actually the realisations of the student. That's the true Dharma, the true wisdom or the true teachings are what the student realises. So 
so it's external to a point but then you have to internalize it to make it real so that's so that's good to know so it's not just a dry scholarly exercise and the sangha or the highest assembly so who would they be Does anyone have a, an idea of who who a member of the sangha or the highest assembly could be all of us yeah they generally say um Generally, they, they talk about the Sangha as the, the monastic community from, from our point of view, but obviously we can all be sp spiritual support brothers and sisters to each other. So you're right. Yep. So that's a very good answer, actually. So, um, um, so it goes to the point also of, you know, we're a student on the journey and can we do it alone? And you need the support of your brothers and sisters or as well you can, it's very hard to do it on your own there are some some students who are, you know in the past you know they're, they're so uh, tuned and realized already that they, that they can just go off into the sunset and meditate and they don't need anything they don't need anyone and they're able to achieve realizations but for most of us it's like we need some support along the way so that's quite valid um, and the virtuous merit that you collect we're practicing giving the other perfection so we say that because during the period where we're listening to the teachings or studying or doing any sort of good good action there's a, a store of merit that's being accumulated by ourselves <coughs> so we're directing that to achieving the state of Buddha the Buddha and we're doing that also we add with that to be able to benefit all sentient beings so it's not for ourselves alone so we're actually turning the motivation away from just ourselves just me you know to all sentient beings so trying to do something for everyone so if you have um, the good motivation then then whatever action you do it'll have virtuous intent so it'll be it'll be supercharged with that so even if the action is not that good because you think well I can't do much meditation I'm a, I'm a poor student I can't study much I, whatever you do because you've got a very good motivation it'll be it'll have the 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 taint or the the impression of virtue it'll be still carry through with whatever action you do so that's that's important to realize as well so we don't we shouldn't keep think oh well, I can't do what the Dalai Lama does, or I can't do what Geshe Doga does, but we can still generate this very good motivation and it still helps our actions. So once you start with a good motivation, uh, so, um, actually Ed asked the question a few, a few weeks ago, do you need to recheck it? Recheck, so you know, go over and over again, you know, different parts of the day. Well, you, you don't need to if, if you've really set it well and, and with um, some sincerity so then that means if you've set a good motivation and particularly if you've set it in the morning start of the day not at the end of the day then all you're checking then is whether your actions are more inclined to virtue or they're more inclined to non-virtue you know that, that's it so you you're then just examining what you're doing so you're having that mindfulness of oh I'm daydreaming I'm dreaming about you know a nice meal and you know you, you, you sort of things like that you can th then check your actions as well or 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 I'm really grasping at the latest um, what can I say what can I say what am I grasping at oh the the latest uh, music or or, or uh, no the latest Avengers film there you go there's one that's real so there you go so the, the latest Avengers films come out so I want to go and see it so there's the, the the mind so you could say well Mark at that point there's not much virtue in my mind because all I'm doing is moving away towards something that's pretty self-centered at that point it's so, okay so so can can anyone see how that would would that cause anyone any problems if you just set your motivation in the morning and then let it go through the day would it present any problems to anyone would any, does anyone feel you'd have to re-establish re it? 
over and over again? You do? Yeah, okay. So if it's useful, you can do it, but I find that doing it once with some sort of you know, sincerity is enough to push, and then all I'm doing is going, well, is it is it Mark who's grasping at something, or Mark who's getting angry at someone, or is it Mark who's thinking about helping someone? So I'm more looking at my actions then, so that seems to me a, a little bit more doable. Except, of course, when you're in a teaching and then they have a break, if you're doing a course, they'll do a dedication, and then they'll come back and they'll re-establish the motivation. They'll, they'll redo these prayers again. So that's a good... You've had a break, the teacher will then re-establish it by going through the refuge and generating bodhicitta prayer. So, um, so the basic Buddhist practice is... Uh, non-harm of others. So, can, does anyone, would anyone like to tell me what that means, non-harm? How, or how can I harm someone? Sorry? Sorry? Offend someone, yes, so with my speech or yeah? Yeah, okay, so there's one, you, your language is harsh, so I could offend someone, so that's harming them. Any, anyone else? Yep. Endless, yep. Can you give me an example? Yes. Yeah, so so there's the the thing about intention, so the motivation because as parent, as a parent, so I've probably failed my children a lot of times, but my intention was never to harm them. So so even if, you know, Mark's a poor parent, you go, Well, I did my best and my intention was to benefit you and etc. So so the the motivation comes in there too, so you can okay. And then the specific actions, like the lady was saying, harsh, you know, the sort of a. What would you would it, would it be telling someone off or putting someone down? Something like that. Yeah. Okay. So there's we we do have a category of um, non-virtuous action or something. It's um, harsh speech in, uh, instead of speaking pleasantly. So instead of speaking pleasantly to someone, we'll ah, you know. We'll give we'll give them a rocket, you know. So, whereas we could switch it and go, still deliver the message or the you know what that you want to cl clearly put, but in a, a tone that's more pleasant, that's not harming them, you know. So you sort of still direct to the point, but the language is better. It's not going to they're not going to freak out over it. Yeah. Sorry, you have a question? Oh. Mhm. Mm Yes. Yes. So, um, so that is one of the. That's a good one too. So, harsh speech and lying. So, there's another one. So, it is considered a harmful action. So, there are some examples that are given. These are extreme examples when it's probably good to lie. When there's someone running and they've run past you and then a minute or so later these people with guns come running and say where did he go you say oh he went that way instead of that way so there's sort of a little bit of wisdom your own wisdom coming in to say well I don't you know, me, me telling the truth in that instance is not gonna it's actually gonna lead to some harm so but generally speaking though the the action of lying it, it, it's generally done with an intent to harm the person or, or protect ourselves. So, and it's easy to do what they call it, well, white lies. So, so you know, it's a f five percent lie or something, and you go oh, five percent of a lie. So it's a bit, sort of a 
anyway that, that, that's one isn't it a white lie they call it so and it, but again if you're presenting the truth again how you present the truth is, is using your skill isn't it you can still present it in such a way that you well someone says um okay who knocked the milk over and there's only two people in the house so you go it's true isn't it it happens you know who knocked the milk over and there's, there's a person asking the question and the, the other person is only two so there's no way out for the the person being asked is there so but they could go oh i think the the dog or whatever the cat or whatever, you know, jumped on the table and you know knocked it over and then jumped back out but so at those times they say it's better to go yeah it was yeah i did it i did it so any anyone else with a, a non-virtue or a, a harmful action sorry betrayal. betrayal how would you give me an example oh just give me a specific one it's not too personal if you like so okay cheating so that's um yeah that there you go there's another one so it's um this one and this one doesn't need to be sexual but it's it's un, it's grouped under the sexual misconduct category betrayal where you you've cheated on your partner with someone else so uh, is there any um, any virtue in that one could there be a virtue in cheating on your partner and with someone else There's lots of shakes anyone sort of oh yeah, yeah that's I could do it <laughs> no so well no because it's not it's not a, a, a honest question because there there is a view that oh well well if I'm not happy with this partner I'll go with that one for the night there is a there is a view out there like that isn't there if you're not happy with that one doesn't matter put him push him aside and find someone better but that definitely yeah, betrayal it's considered a non-virtue so so could any anything well I shouldn't say could anything good come of it because sometimes you know things evolve the part the other partners out the new partners in and it might be happy happy days for both so so I can't you can't equivocally say oh well, it's you know it'll always be bad but gen generally we say that that action of betrayal it's not 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 virtuous because you you've harmed the partner you're with you probably created the habit to harm the one you're going with because that was easy or well, you know why not you know so there's there's a lot of things that can come up because of that so Okay, so so if you flip it round and said, "All right, I'm going to try and avoid these actions," and there's there's a list of ten, ten, ten virtuous actions, and they're opposite the ten non-virtuous actions. So that that's for you to go away and look at look at. So they're the basic Buddhist baseline non-harm. So if you can keep them, I mean. Uh, have some integrity with my relationships not lie not steal etc kill my speeches is okay you know all those things come into it my mind's not grasping you know there's all these things there's 10 of them so it's worth looking at them and they're opposite so the opposites are the virtuous when you spin them around so it's worth looking at those so um so if i'm not harming someone am i benefiting them Not necessarily. Why do you say that, Ed? Okay. Yeah. Yes. 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 
Yeah, that's a very good point Ingrid's made. So, so not harming, so I've refrained from harming, it's good enough. Then is there any benefit in that? Well, I haven't actually turned to benefit you, but I've, I've not harmed you. For some people and for some beings, some animals, that's enough. If my partner doesn't harm me, my master doesn't harm me, I'm happy. So, so it's not necessarily, oh, I'm actively going to you know, seek out to make you happy, but if I'm not harming you, there's that, that thing of peace and satisfaction with the person or the master, if it's a pet or something like that, that makes them more secure and happy. So that's, in a way, that's virtue. Even though Ingrid's point, you haven't gone out of your way to do anything good apart from not harming, but the non-harm is still very powerful. So, again, again you see this with um, cases of uh, child abuse, animal abuse, and spousal abuse, and murder of you know people's partners. You go, well, hold on, that that you know that they're, they're the mind of non-harm's gone for those people. They want to just harm the the other the other being. So you just go well. So for someone to refrain from that, immediately the environment's more peaceful. So it's very good. It's a very good thing to be able to do that. Um, so in the past few weeks, we've covered. Uh, a few Buddhist topics. So we've covered mainly the mind of anger being a non-virtuous mind and it'll only lead to harm for ourselves and others. And every week I've asked the question, every week people have said, oh yeah, it's definitely a non-virtuous action and it doesn't lead to any benefit. Is there anyone who's willing to say, no, no, it, there is some benefit coming out of anger? Yes. Yes. Mhm. Mm yeah. So, okay. So, because you, your point about driving is a very good one. Because again, I'm, I'm one of those. So. Oh, I'm okay, I'm okay, and then get behind the wheel, and it's suddenly it's like dodging cars, you know, like <laughs> she's cut me off, or I've cut them off, or honk honk, and then shake the, f you know, this all that comes, and I th and then when I get out of the car, I go, well, where where was that mark? Where did that mark come from? So uh, I, to your point about being on the road and acting, quite often uh, what we're asked to do in Buddhism is not to uh, stifle the response but to do it without anger. So to still think, oh, well, that person is, you know, is, it's not safe, so, you know, back off or whatever, but not get angry. Not, you, you try not to use the, ang the emotion of anger while you're acting. So you're still acting, there's no, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna stifle it, I'm gonna hold it in, and then, it, and then it, I'm, when, when the drive's finished, I'm, I'm really shaky. We're still, we're, we're still acting, we're acting and reacting but we're not getting angry at that point. So that's difficult to do without techniques. So, but we say though that the, ang the emotion of anger never leads to any good outcome. Never, so yep. Just to stop the yes, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. So really then, so I, I use the example of my children. So I, have got, I had a daughter when she was younger, she was no sense of uh, no sense of danger, you know. So, so very much a, oh, I'll go there. You know, this is on a bike. You know, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go left or I'll go right, and so she had no sense that there was a car coming behind her or to the side. So sense of so the thing was for me to, be, to yell at her, to scream at her, stop. You know, so but that so that wasn't from that point of view. It wasn't out of anger. It was more out of not wanting her to come to any harm. 
So it was reasonably clear that, you know, I wasn't getting personally angry at my daughter. It was just more trying to protect her. So so it's a bit different. It's again trying to... It was it anger that I was doing, ac acting out of. So, yeah. Anyway, th th these are all things for you to look at because the um, for four weeks out of five, we've had no, no one saying that our anger is good and then this week we've had a few people saying well in this situation that's right it could be useful but so but in from the buddhist um point of view we'd say that it just leads to harm so that, that again that's something for for you to examine whether that's true or not i think for most of you sort of worked out well in real life in practical terms when i've you when i've been angry i haven't had a peaceful happy mind it's been up, i've gotten upset the other person's gotten upset, neither of us happy, and that continues on. In fact, it, it sort of builds that cycle over and over again. So, so uh, one of the um, uh, antidotes to anger is the mind of patience. So we can cultivate this mind of patience through listening, contemplating, and meditation. So that's the three wisdom tools so listening, so you're listening like you're listening now, and then thinking about was contemplating. So that's your own wisdom, just sort of turning it over and going, does it make sense? Does it apply, etc. And then the third one is the meditation. So we we say you have to do them in that order. You don't have to perfect it, listening before you can do contemplating or meditation, but you need to have a go at each. Okay. And then the patience we're talking about, there's the first one is um, ignoring the harm caused by others. So because in Buddhism we say that the mind of anger has hatred attached to it. So at that point when you're angry, you're hating that person. You have the hatred. It's not love, affection, it's hatred at that point. So, so when you're patient, you're able to just go, uh, I can accept what's happening the mind of hatred doesn't arise so at that point you've cut anger just for that moment so you've got some peace the second one is patience is um, enduring hardship or suffering and why would you do that so if you're on a spiritual path which is how Buddhism describes it you, you can see an end goal so you're willing to do those things along the way that will help you get there and one of them might be look okay this person's all over me they're you know screaming and yelling my goal is here thanks very much and then keep moving you know you don't you, don't, you won't react to their their harm or their anger you're willing to put up with it so there's a little bit of so that's patient that's a second form of patience So it means you're not discouraged by difficulties. So, so a good example of this is the whole His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So you know he's a refugee. He left Tibet when he was young. Was it 1956, 1959? Anyway, he left a long time ago, thinking that the whole community that left would be back within two or three years back in Tibet. It's now 2019, so they've, they've been gone a long time. So, in that time, he's had to accept, or you know, he would have accepted. Well, this is where we are. We have to re-establish our community here in India and all over the world. So it's a bit of just um, not being discouraged by challenges that have come up from time to time. So, and you, and you can hear that in his words. He's always talking about, you know. I can't worry about the, the what what's happened. I, I can. I'll just. Do what I can to help now. Do what I can, do what I can do. So not being discouraged too much by circumstance. Now the third type of patience is, and this is for um, this one is a difficult one. This one is not being um, not being afraid to tap, tackle difficult subjects 
So to have the patience to go, well, gee, it's really hard and it's tough, I can't, but I won't give up. I'll just, I'll keep having a go at it and I'll, I'll, I'll put it aside and then I'll come back to it. So this might be things like the law of cause and effect, rebirth, you know, that, that it's hard to get your mind around and also how things exist. You know, uh, you know, when we examine the mind of anger, is it, is it concrete? So, so there's a, there's a lot of to topics in Buddhism where you think, oh, well, that's too highfalutin for me. But to have the patience to be able to just keep going and push in and is is very good. So it's a, that's a, so there's three forms of patience that you're being asked to look at and develop as a, as a spiritual practitioner. So. Um, So we'll, I was going to say we'll do some meditation, but I've got one, one question. So um, if we were going to try and not harm others, but try and benefit them, and um, shouldn't others be trying to benefit us and not harm us? Sorry, what's that? That would be good. Okay, that would be good, that would be ideal, that would be heaven. So, yeah, yeah, so that would be great, wouldn't it? If we were giving it our best shot and others were doing the same, they weren't going to harm us, they were trying to benefit us, it would be really good, wouldn't it? Life would be fabulous, wouldn't it? Because you'd go, well, I've got no reason to be unhappy because I've got people who are looking after me and taking care of me and everyone's being nice. But does that happen? No, this is, this is sort of. So, so we're we're sort of developing in Buddhism. We're trying these mental tools for us to be developing the mind of patience, non-harm, love and compassion, wisdom. So all these tool, all these things we're trying to develop, so that regardless of what the other person or the environment does we can still retain a happy, peaceful mind. So, so that's very important to, to realise as well. So, because if they, they say with the happiness you develop internally, it's indestructible. Once you get it, nothing can throw you off it. Because it's internal. So that would be good, wouldn't it? If you had that, if you had that happiness that was there all the time and it was internal and it wasn't dependent on what someone said or whether, you know, you got a million dollars or, you know, a new car, whatever, it was just internal happiness, then that would, I think that would be ideal, huh? So that's why there's this thing of, well, it doesn't, doesn't matter so much how the external world or the people treat you. So, you know, it's good, nice to have, but it's not the main thing. The main thing is what you can work on internally. Uh, so let's do some meditation. So, um, so, uh, so, <coughs> so in terms of our own wish for happiness, um, uh, which we agree is a valid wish to have, then positive actions will bring about positive results for us and likewise the negative actions will bring about some form of suffering result. So we're going to use the technique of meditation to, to enable that us to experience what this mind of happiness is like. So, so the main thing is back straight Uh, eyes half open, half closed. The hands are in the position on the lap. So the right hand's on top of the left. Your thumbs are touching and then pointing back towards the navel. Your mouth's closed and you're breathing through your nose. And then the object of meditation is the breath. So the sensation in and out through the nostrils. Now to center or focus your mind, you can envision that in enlightened energy or lights or nectars are coming in, filling you with happiness, 
And then as you're breathing out, all your worries and troubles are leaving you. So do, do that for a few moments, just focus on that enlightened energy coming in and then the, all the worries and concerns going out. Then switch um, your object of meditation to the breath, the sensation of the breath as it goes in and out through your nostrils. So we're actually using a mental image of that. So, and just breathe gently, naturally, in and out, and try and keep our focus on 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 that object of meditation. So then um, stay in your meditation and then we'll switch um, to an image in front of us of someone we know who is able to push our buttons and make us angry. Is the person at fault? or their afflicted mind of anger. Is the anger we are feeling solid permanent, existing independent of any causes or conditions? Does the anger exist from its own side? What happens when we analyze just the anger that we're feeling? So 
So, uh, so bring your attention slowly back to the room and open your eyes. Okay. So the first part of that uh, meditation focusing on the breath, that's used to develop uh, concentration or focus. So, so it's very important to have that. Because otherwise, if you don't have that, then you, you have a very scattered mind. You, you know, you, you try and focus on one thing and your mind is thinking about something else. So, so focusing on the breath is very good for just developing that concentration. So it's very useful for when you're meditating, but also very useful for outside of meditation. If you can concentrate well, you can do things well, you can start, start a task and finish it. So, so it's very useful in all spheres. So the second part of the meditation on anger, so that was really, we we're doing some form of analytical meditation. So that's very useful as well. So they're the two types of meditation that we do. So there's sort of a focused meditation or concentration meditation and analytical. So you can you can swing from one to the other, but you need to have some concentration to be able to do the analytical one. So it's helpful if you can focus. So so um, so when we analyze the anger that we were feeling, I'm, I'm assuming people did have some semblance or feeling of anger, that they were able to bring up someone that brought that up in them? Yeah? No? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure it, it's, it, it, there's generally someone <laughs> who causes anger with it for us. So, um, so when we analyze that anger, not the person, but the anger itself, was it, how, how did it appear? Any a reaction? Yes. Was it a, a feeling? A feeling? And did it feel solid? A solid feeling. Yes. Yep. Yep. So, so I've, I've mentioned this before, I think. But His Holiness the Dalai Lama says he does that technique when he gets angry. So it begs the question: Does he get angry? If you know him. So you think, but he has a very sharp mind. So, like that sharp, you know, razor sharp. So, for him, it'll be like, hold on, you're my attendant. You should be doing this. You know, like this way. You know, because. But then he says, when he meditates on it, he, he doesn't meditate on the person who's um, uh, caused some grating. You know, sort of like, Ugh. but he he meditates on the feeling, and then he looks at it and goes, is it? You know, is it solid, rock solid? Is it a rock solid feeling that shift? Can I see through it? And then what he says was when he does that, it's like a bubble. When he looks at it, the intensity of the anger dissipates quite markedly. So, so that's good, isn't it? Because if it was at one with you, permanent, rock solid, unchanging, if you had it, you'd never get rid of it. But it's not like that, particularly with anger, because it's so quick to rise. So you can actually go examine it, and when you focus on it, its intensity can just dissipate. So that's a good thing with anger. Um, did anyone ever any else have? Did anyone have any other experiences have? Anger? Yes? Fear. Yes. I fear the un... It was something like, I fear the unknown, therefore I'll lash out. Yes. As anger towards them. Yeah. Ego protecting itself. Yes. Um, so the. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll just come back to um, 
some teaching so if you can this is again I think it's his holiness the Dalai Lama Lynn you can correct me if I'm wrong on this so it's um, uh, if you can't if you can do something about a situation why worry and if you can't do something about a situation why worry so so he's given you two techniques there so so in in the example you've used about fear if it's uh, ir irrational fear yeah it's going to happen the person's going to harm me or leave me and you can you do anything about it maybe not so why worry and if it's an ir irrational fear and they're not going to leave you you know sort of can't do anything about it why worry so there's sort of a his holiness is saying Elin is it his holiness that says that yep yep yeah Shanti Deva as well okay okay yep yes yes So that, yeah, okay, so experience that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yourself so yeah yeah perceived so okay so the it comes still comes back to the point Shantideva you're saying okay there you go so Shantideva so there's another text worth reading the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life so 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 if you can do something about the situation do it and don't worry if you can't do something about the situation, don't worry. You know why worry? So you sort of, a, and your point, Ingrid, about that sort of self-defense mechanism. It's interesting because going into something with a sense of fear, to me, doesn't. I, I can see how it's justified, and you know, but I can't see how it would lead to any form of happiness, because you're already defensive, huh? You're not open to, at that point, being happy. So it's quite quite tricky, I think, that one. But again, through listening, contemplating meditation, there are ways to see through situations. And one of the, the patients to accept, you know, to put up with hardship, to have that. Oh, I've got a longer term goal. I'm happy to just bear with this. So th so the. So there are different ways of looking at it. I think that the fear, even if it's you're saying it's not justified, it's good to, if you can say, well, I, I shouldn't feel this way, but I do. I don't feel feel really threatened or vulnerable or fearful. Then try and address that, because that's the thing. You go, well, is it rational? You know, is it is it going to happen? Is something worse going to or going to happen to me again? You know, you. Because sometimes I think going in with the mindset that it's I'm stepping into the lion's den with the expectation that it's terrible then can bring it you know can make it even worse. Whereas those who've got that ability to just go oh well, oh yeah I'm going there but been there done that and then finished gone and and then well why was I so why did I get so overwrought about that previously it didn't seem it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be so there's a little bit of that. Um, 
Anyone else have any other experience with anger? With bringing up someone who brings on anger or promotes anger or provokes it in you? No? So we've got about 10 minutes. So last week we covered um, a little bit on. Um, that that karma has um, uh, the, the, sorry the the act, karmic act when you do a complete karmic act say you, that you you'll get some results that will be similar to the cause so in terms of anger you'll have one that's habit so if you're angry one time you're imprinting on in your mind the habit to respond that way again so that's pretty natural isn't it natural to think like that huh I did you know oh I blew my stack it gives you that thing of the oh yeah I'll do it next time that happens I'll do it again you know that gives you that sort of impetus to for that to happen so the result so that's the result similar to cause in terms of car the karmic act of anger in terms of habit the, the result similar to cause in terms of the experience with the act of anger is one's own life will be full of anger and conflict with others. So does that ring true? If you're a combustible, volatile person who's prone to bouts of anger, that that's, that'll be what you attract. Conflict with others so so there's no peace for that person if they've got that mind if they're always on the you know combustible uh, and then the other experience one will have is one friend one's friends will be few is that true we have lots of friends if you're angry or or, or not many or none Sorry? If they're all angry together, yeah, they might be a club. Yeah, 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 it's true. That's true. You could, yeah, yeah, if you, you know, uh, peas in a pod. So you go, you're all combustible with each other, so you all get on well. So, but, but generally though, and this is human nature, but also all beings like this, that they go, uh, if the person just keeps barking at me and barking at me and yelling at me, yelling at me you know, I'll go, in, eventually if they're my friend, there'll be this sort of parting. I don't, the, oh, I never see my friends anymore. What, I wonder what's happening, you know. And they just sort of, they, they exit stage left. It's true. They, go, they find a reason not to be around you. So it's sort of like that with anger. So... Uh, the result, uh, so the sec so that's the result, the two results similar to the cause, so you have it and you experience. So they're not, with anger, it's not, so it's not that good just in, in your experience in this life and also the habits you have. And then the result of fruition, now this is talking about the act of anger, whatever it was, it's the last moment in your life. It's the karma that ripens, that sends you, that that takes you to the next, exist the next birth, rebirth. So you go. So it wasn't the the mind of love or peace and happiness or the the motivation for all sentient beings by achieving life. It was, oh, sh he did that to me when I was fifteen, and uh, so it's that mind that that's the. The karma that ripens. So, if the act that was done at that point was, you know, terrible, then the result is uh, either a poor rebirth in a in a lower realm, as we say, or a shorter life. So, so that's one reason we say that the point of death is so important that your mind is good, it's clear virtuous etc now if your mind is you know uh, 
virtuous all the way through, more, more prone to virtue than non, then you've got more of a chance of at death having a virtuous mind. If your mind is volatile up and down and more prone to anger, etc., and the guru of the Lama says, oh, Mark, turn your mind around at death to a virtuous mind, it's going to be very hard for me to do it because my habits are well formed to, to have anger, to, to react like that. So even if the, the Lama says, you know, turn, you know, swing away, do this, do that, it, because of my past non-virtuous mind, that's the, the predominant mind in my life, is that, it'll be very hard then at the point of death for me to sort of suddenly swing to virtue. It can be done, but very difficult. So the third uh, result and, um, is uh, the result of the environment. So, so you, what's your environment like because of uh, acts of anger? So, so the environment is hell, poor conditions. There is no room for happiness. A room full of, uh, sorry, a home full of arguments and a workplace full of conflict. So, it, so this is the, if you like, the environmental result. So that's the external result. The, the first one is the result. Some of the cause is really your own inner experience in the main. So this last one is the, what's the environment like if, if the mind's predominantly filled with anger. So, so they're all very complicated um, topics. They're not easy to get a handle on. So that's what I'd encourage you to do because um, if the more you can study and, and learn about them, the, the better your understanding will be. And then you can actually utilize that knowledge to help you in your daily life. So what, a what actions to cultivate and which ones to turn away from. Does anyone have any questions on those? No? Okay, so I think we'll finish there. So, um, so you can we can stop, we can go into a meditation pose again and I'll just read the dedication prayer so this is the if you like the second book in the first one was um, motivation and the second one is dedication so so just internalize this and uh, as best as we can we'll just do, um, See if, see if we can uh, bring this to mind, bring this into our hearts. So, may I quickly become Guru Lord Buddha and lead each and every sentient being into his enlightened realm because of these merits. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen never diminish, but increase more and more. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, uh, all the best for um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the month of April and um, next month is um, Judy Main who's the centre director and also a very good Monday night teacher so um, I encourage you to come so we've got um, tea and cake and biscuits outside in the in the lounge coffee lounge so thank you <laughs>